Rutgers legendary champions, next generation stars, and tireless ambassadors of the game, sharing their wisdom and guiding your journey to high achievement on the green felt. This is Chasing Poker Greatness with your host, Brad Wilson. What is happening, my friend, and welcome back to Chasing Poker Greatness. I'm your host, Brad Wilson, and today I'm going to be speaking with GPA, Poker Journalist of the Year, presenter, deep thinker, storyteller, and all-around amazing human being, Sarah Herring. Sarah has been a part of the Poker News family since 2011 and is one of the most visible editors slash writers to appear in the publication. She has interviewed a who's who in the poker world, has a ridiculously long list of published articles, and is also the host of the Poker News podcast. Sarah and I's conversation is wide-ranging and takes us through her life in Hollywood and film, a stint in the clink, which is a true story, believe it or not, and dives deep into how life setbacks often lead us down unforeseen paths where we discover the real treasures of the human experience, love, friendships, and adventure. We also cover Sarah's poker origin story that involves a giant pair of brass knuckles and her then boyfriend, now husband, MMA fighter Heath Herring. Sarah is such a delight and warm human being that just through hearing her stories, honesty, and outlook on life, you leave the conversation feeling happy and energized. As our discussion unfolds, she'll talk about what it's like to be in constant contact with some of poker's elite high rollers why you should never give a poker player a microphone, and how despite our canyon-like differences in beliefs, all human beings are more similar than you might think. My conversation with Sarah was one of the most fun and enjoyable ones I've had the pleasure of being a part of while doing this show. And so, without any further ado, I present to you Global Poker Awards Journalist of the Year, Sarah Herring on Chasing Poker Greatness. Sarah, good afternoon. How are we doing? I am fantastic. I just was in the midst of an epic storm, which is after living in Las Vegas for 10 years, just a good rainstorm is probably one of the most refreshing things. I love it. Not much rain in Vegas? <laughs> Did not receive a lot of moisture <laughs> living in the city of sin. Uh, I drank a lot to compensate, I think, for the lack of moisture on the outside, but yeah, man, I just, it's like I never get sick of the rainstorms. I'm pretty sure everyone in Houston is sick of them, but I, I'm like the, you know, child still where I just want to go run in it. It's a good, it's a good headspace to be. Loving, yeah. loving the rain, loving the weather. I lived in Los Angeles for a few years and it never rained, ever. Never. It's just like beautiful all the time. And people, some people love that. Yeah, I'm one of them. <laughs> I do love <laughs> <laughs> I was just, I was flying back from LA uh, a couple days ago and in Salt Lake City, like I lifted up the, um, you know, the little window on the airplane and it was just snowing when we were, you know, landing. And then like the whole time I was at the airport, I was like, oh my gosh, I just love this. And it's so cool. It's so crazy. I just did a podcast with someone in Florida who was outside in the sun. And then I was here like having this storm and then my mom told me it's snowing in Colorado and I'm like, God, the world is just like so cool. <laughs> so crazy and cool. Weather. Yeah. Oh, weather. <laughs> it's crazy. And I think especially like these kind of months, you know, like the October, November, when things start to shift and things start to change, it's, it makes you, well, acutely aware if you're somewhere that things don't change. Yes. It's, I will say that I do enjoy having four seasons if not for just being grateful for fall, because fall is, fall is my favorite of the seasons. Me too. Me too. Hands down. No questions. I landed in Minneapolis, like, I don't know, last week. And the fucking trees, like the red and the yellow and just, I miss that so much. Yeah. Uh, I, I wish it lasted longer. Um, in the Southeast, it lasts for about nine and one third days. And then it's just cold. <laughs> then, it, <laughs> then it's done. Um, so let's start this out by 
telling me the story. How did you get into poker in the first place? And you can even start like a little bit before poker because I know that you were involved in Hollywood, right? Yes. Yeah. So um, I always wanted to be in the film industry. And I I started, I think, like every other little girl that's like, I want to be an actress. Like, who doesn't want to (laughs) be? Where where did you live? In Colorado. I grew up in Colorado and I just was like, like my, we would make, um, my family and I would make like home movies and we did like the great train robbery and like we would reenact old movies and, uh, I was always the star and you know how it is when you're like your whole family and all your friend group and everyone, like I, I had headshots and I would sign them like, Oh, when I'm famous, this is going to be worth so much money. But then I actually started auditioning for movies and TV shows and things that were coming through Colorado. And I realized quite quickly that I actually didn't like auditioning at all. And uh, <laughs> why, why not? I, I think the idea of like begging for work, which is really what you have to do. And I have so much respect for people who do that. Um, what do you mean by my, begging? I mean, really, you are begging for work. Like everyone you meet is like a potential maybe this person will like put me in their next big movie or when you go and you, it's like, a, it's a terrifying process. I think auditioning because you're literally just being judged. And then the craziest thing is, cause then I worked in casting um, a little bit. Also the craziest thing is you can be perfect, like perfect for the role. Great performance. You know, you're physically, everything is great, but they just happen to cast like another character who also looks kind of like you or is like your height or your hair color or your ethnicity. And it's like, Oh, next. Like even after everything and all the work you put into things, even if you do the most perfect job, still, it's kind of like, eh. and I, there's variance in everything, but I realized pretty early on that I just didn't for my, my own pride and my own ego, it was like not going to work for me to be um, in front of the camera if it (laughs) meant I had to audition and things. So I started looking into other jobs behind the camera and other ways to be involved in film. And I pretty quickly also discovered, I thought I wanted to be a director, but then I worked on several films and I realized that actually um, for my skill set and for my personality, the job of assistant director was basically actually exactly what I wanted all along. What is the difference? So basically a director just deals with the talent. Like they show up and their whole job is more or less to get the best performance out of the the talent. They like work a little bit with the director of photography and of course with all the other like heads of departments to get their vision going. But the person who actually runs the show is the AD. So this is the person who schedules everything, who brings it in, you know, on budget, who talks to to the heads of department, make sure the actors are there and dressed and ready when the director gets there. They're actually the person who yells rolling and cut. They just basically are the, it would be like if you had another type of business, this person would be your manager, essentially. It's like the one who's actually there, like running everything. Um, And so for me, it was like, I got the attention, I think that I craved from being like the center of everything on the set, but uh, without having to do the auditioning, which was just not something that was ever going to work for me. And um it was going awesome. I actually was, I moved to Los Angeles. I went to film school at NYU and I uh, realized after my sophomore year that I probably, I shouldn't say I realized, my mom was like, dude, have you seen what your bills are going to look like when you get out of college? And it was something like even in my junior year, still there, I was going to have to start paying like $900 a month because I had a lot of private loans and we talked about it. I tried to figure out ways to still get my degree from NYU without actually going there. So I spent um, a semester in Prague, but I just realized after a while that I was like spinning my wheels and it was just going to cost me like a ton of money and it was stupid. So I moved to LA. I took all the money I had left and just uh, didn't have a job for two months. I just took my like $5,000 and I paid like a couple months rent and, you know, got had enough for groceries and getting by. I even like just stole other people's internet and like, I was so (laughs) cheap. Um, but I worked for free for two months on a lot of different productions in LA and 
after that two months, I just never had any problem finding work. I had lots of work and I ended up actually getting pretty lucky. It was a bad situation that ended up being really good. Basically a producer that I worked for ended up being kind of a sketch ball. And I was actually second ADing on a director's, like a guild movie, um, uh, like a SAG director's guild movie, but they were paying me and treating me like I was on a low budget production, which was fine. That's what I was used to. And that's what I signed up for. But essentially um, they were turned in to the director's guild that they were basically, if you, if you do a, like a union show, everyone has to be union and everyone has to get paid union salaries. So once they found out that they were doing a union show, but basically pocketing all the money they should have been giving to the rest of us, I got this nice little payday. And then I was offered the opportunity to be Taft Heart lead as um, one of the youngest women ever to get into the DGA. So I was super excited. That was like my dream life. And it was happening way sooner than I thought. How old were you? What year is this? 24. So it was 2007 is when that happened, I think. Yeah. So I was just like, oh, cool. It's all happening. Everything's been going perfect. It's great. Uh, I worked on this movie sex blood and fights which later came out never surrender but it had a bunch of fighters in it um like ufc fighters and i met my husband and we started dating and he was in vegas at the time i was in la but we would just like go back and forth and meet each other different places and i was actually doing reshoots for that movie and something had happened with the location situation and basically i ended up going into work one night thinking I was coming in the next morning and they said no you can you have like three days off the location fell through you can have three days off and so my husband said come to Vegas let's let's do something so I just went straight to the airport and um, as I'm going through the conveyor belt at the airport they are like hey is this your bag and I said yes and inside of the bag was a prop from the night before from the movie which was brass (laughs) brass knuckles <laughs> and this is a very very bad crime in california they have uh, a brass really st- knuckles crime yeah it's it's a possession felony possession of a deadly weapon and they have these very specific laws in california in place because of trying to combat all of the gang law gang problems and stuff in the 90s So they made all these rules, which are like hard and fast, no, you know, making deals. If you have, actually, if I had a gun in my purse, it would have been less of a problem because I could just say, oh, I use it for self-defense and I just forgot it was in there. But basically the only reason that you would have brass knuckles is if you were like an aggressor in a situation, like it's not like a self-defense tool, basically. (laughs) No, no, hold on, hold on. Don't accost (laughs) me. Let me put these brass knuckles on first. (laughs) <laughs> exactly. And the best part is like, I mean, honestly, they were like three times too big for my hand. And <laughs> I actually, I had just, I literally went with just my purse. So I had like the call sheets and stuff from the night before. I was like, oh, I'm an AD. This is like, I was on a movie, you know, the actor just gave this to me to, to bring in tomorrow. And we didn't end up like, they don't care. And it's so funny because the TSA, this was at Bob Hope airport in Burbank and the poor TSA people, I think they had no idea what they were actually doing because even they said well there's like some flights later on maybe you can catch a flight at nine which is like I was getting arrested so like I wasn't going to be catching any flights and I think the seriousness of it didn't really hit me until really I got to the jail um and it was a Friday and they told me oh you won't get arraigned until Tuesday and I'm like what (laughs) like I'm sorry I'm gonna spend like all weekend in Los Angeles County jail uh you guys this is like a mistake this is not I didn't like commit a crime, please. Uh, but yeah, I did. And um, you spent until Tuesday in jail. No, I got out, fortunately. And I fully think it was a God thing because it makes no sense. They told me when I got to jail, they said, um, you know, you can have your phone call or whatever. Um, but they said it has to be a landline and it has to be in California, which like, I didn't know anyone <laughs> with a landline in California. So I was just like, okay, I guess I'm screwed. Like, I have no idea. Um, but because it, this was, it, it was also a federal crime because it was in the airport. Uh, I was put in this separate cell from everyone else, which actually in 
I was really grateful for because there's a lot of like super drunk, really crazy people. You could just hear them like screaming and uh, going bananas. But I was in my own cell by myself and there was a phone inside of the cell, a weird phone. I don't know. I've never seen anything like it. But what do you mean a- weird? Let's describe this phone. It wasn't like a regular phone. It was kind of like maybe what a pay phone might have looked like, but it was like, they had like a digital screen. I don't know. None of it made any sense, but you, there's literally nothing to do when you get arrested. They don't give you a book or anything to just hang out with. So you just sit in there trying to think of how your life is falling apart. And so I just called Keith a bunch of times, who is my now husband, who was going to be picking me up at the airport. I just kept calling his phone number. And then one time it just picked up. He picked up. And of course I was bawling and being a maniac. I don't even know what I said to him. And I think from what he said to me, he could only hear me for like 10 seconds or something, but he heard me say, they took my clothes. I got arrested. And basically that was all he heard. So he had an attorney, um, I think on retainer at that time. And he called that attorney who also was licensed in California and Nevada. That attorney got a hold of my mom who posted the bail for me. And, um, yeah, so I, I did end up getting out that Saturday. I spent one night in jail. They let me out on Saturday and they kept my cowboy boots. I was wearing cowboy boots and they kept them because I was so dangerous that even cowboy boots could be dangerous in my hands. Yes, you are just a walking weapon. I mean, really, everyone should go look up my mugshot because like, I just look like a, such a mess of a woman. Um, <laughs> But basically, I, I still thought I had to pay the $1,200 for the um, bail, but I still thought, oh, this is a big, dumb mistake, and they're just going to drop the charges when they figure out that I'm not a criminal. But that's not what happened. And long story short, it cost about $10,000, of which he paid for the attorney. But then there was all these fees, and then I had to spend two months, so 48 hour days of community service, which was crazy. 48 hour days of community yes. service. Yes. Holy crap. So it was like, I didn't, I had gotten this paycheck from doing that movie. And then it's around $7,000 to, at the time it was around $7,000 to get into the DGA. So my whole thing was, I'm going to take that money. I'm going to use it to get into the DGA. And then like my career is off and running. Well, I ended up having to spend that money on like fees and also to just pay for life because for two months I couldn't work but it ended up being the best thing ever because um basically I was gonna have to be I forget what they call it there's a name for it but I was just gonna be like on the side of the road with actual criminals probably and drug addicts and people who you know people that like probably would convince me to do something crazy or bad or I don't know I just was like I don't want to be like on the side of the highway doing this and I wanted to do like some sort of community service that would actually like service the community like I don't want to pick up garbage like that's a punishment that's not a service so Heath was my husband went to a um like a charity poker tournament and he met someone there who was the head of the Nevada Partnership for Homeless Youth he was just kind of telling him this story about what had happened to me. And that guy said, oh, if she wants to do community service, she can come do it um, with us for sure. And so we had the attorney, which thank God I had an attorney. I can't even imagine what would have happened to me if he hadn't had an attorney and paid for it. But I, it, I definitely learned a lot about the legal system in this spot because I thought if you're not guilty, who cares? Like just get a public defender and it'll be fine. And that's, I, unfortunately, that's not Not, how not the case. Yeah. And so basically my attorney negotiated with the judge that I could serve my community service in Nevada. I had to then stay in Nevada until the you know duration of my time uh, was over. And it was actually really cool. I mean, of course I would have rather been working and making money, but all these homeless kids trying to apply for colleges and um, you know, they were like, some of them were into basketball and some were into hip hop. And I was like, I got to teach them how to make little movies and stuff so that they could submit, submit some of them with their college applications. And also just to make like music videos and things like, I just got to teach them some fun things that I think it was cool. It felt cool. Cause I was like, oh, this is something that they probably could actually use in their lives that they may or may not ever have been exposed to. And for me, it was like, oh, this is what I like doing anyways. Um, and on every set I was generally teaching new PAs and stuff. I worked on a lot of low budget 
um, basically you have to start over and train everyone, like every movie, because a lot of the people who are, start, they're starting out. So it was, it was actually cool. And I moved in with Heath during that time. And I think that was a good thing ultimately for our relationship. And we ended up, I went to Palm Springs with him. He had a restaurant for a little while, but we came back to Nevada. And by the time we came back, I had kind of realized that the filmmaking thing wasn't working anymore because I would leave for two months at a time or, you know, six or seven weeks at a time, which is fine when you're single. But when you really are crazy about someone being gone for two months is a long time. And I just realized, I think that I kind of wanted to try and see what else there was out there. So I just went on Craigslist, which was still a thing then. And I mean, it was, it's a thing now, but like for more than just like prostitutes and stuff, (laughs) it was like for actual work. For more than misconnections. (laughs) Yes. Uh, so I, I saw a job for it. They, it, the title was production assistant for the world series of poker, which was a definite downgrade from where I was in my career. But I think compared to auditioning, right. Which I think when I was 16, I just didn't have the capacity to deal with rejection or downgrades or, you know, I was still like in a very fragile ego place. This, I kind of was like, well, whatever, I'm new. This is like a new thing for me. I don't know about poker, so it'll be cool to um, start over, I guess, and try something else. And so, and I went to interview at Matthew Parvis's house. I'm still super grateful for him. But when I think about that, that's insane. I literally drove to his house after seeing an advertisement on Craigslist (laughs) by myself, knocked on the door, like went right in. If he was a serial killer... We would be doing a different show for sure. Where where was Heath? Uh, I did not bring Heath with me to the interview. I did not think that would be very cute. Well, not like to the interview, but he you could have like given him a, a general direction as to where you were going. Yeah, I'm pretty sure he had an address. Like if something would have gone down, he could have come and saved me. But I, th- I knew I was going to be okay because right when I got there, um, there was these two little, you know, they're, they're the dogs, like little Scottish... I, it was like no I was just like okay this guy like he is not a serial killer he has these two adorable tiny little dogs like I'm pretty sure I'm okay and he said you know you're overqualified I don't think this is probably the right job for you and I was like Ugh, but <laughs> that's like the worst <laughs> thing ever like what does that even mean yeah. how can you be overqualified like help me you want someone who's not as skilled doing the job I'm willing to do it for the same amount of money so let's let's try it and he said okay cool so we I went uh, for during the World Series that summer. I basically just helped schedule everything and make sure people were there on time and just kind of like kept track of things. But while I was just sitting around there, I was also reading the blogs, watching the videos, trying to understand how this industry worked. And I had actually, I had two things scheduled, two films scheduled right after the World Series that I had initially intended to do. And then right towards the end of the summer, they said, do you want to go to Brazil with the team and produce content for poker stars? And I was like, yes. So I bailed on my movie jobs. I took on a position, which I think at that time was like part-time at Poker News. And I started producing content all without a host in the camera. So I was doing mostly stuff for poker stars and just, you know, showcasing their pros and making videos about the places where they were having events. And then I got in front of the camera about two years later, someone named Alan Rogers, who was then the head of content at Poker Stars said, I think you should try being in front of the camera. And I was really bad at first, for sure. That was definitely, I was bad, which also makes sense why it was hard for me to do the auditioning thing. I think it was really hard for me to be myself on camera at first. But I'm really also grateful to him for seeing that. And I think... How did you get better? I always say that I think, you know, like God's path for me was like way better than the path I had for myself. I was like, you only know what you see, right? Like I, you see like movie stars, like, oh, okay, I want to be a movie star. Like you, you only can know. But then really when you just start following the natural course of your life, when you get there, you're like, oh, this fits. This is why I wanted to be on camera. This is why like, I wanted to know how to produce and direct. And 
like my job now, I think encompasses all the things that I knew I liked and wanted, but didn't even know that this was a job. And you get better just by, um, well, my husband at first said, I remember I was, you're, you're the most nervous at first, of course, right? You're the most scared to be judged. And I remember my husband, I showed him and he's like, who is this girl? Like, why are you trying to be like the nice girl? That's not you. It's not you. <laughs> and you can even hear in my voice, like my voice was like, hey guys, it's like a different, it's not my real voice. And I didn't really, I think, process what he was saying until Christy told me the first time I did an event on my own, uh, I had like a blooper reel, <laughs> pretty fucking solid blooper reel. <laughs> I want to know the truth. <laughs> and uh, Christy said, oh my gosh, that is my favorite thing that you've ever produced so far because it's, it's you and you are entertaining and you are fun. But whenever you, the lights turn on on the camera, it's like you stop being yourself and so I think slowly over time with people just saying, hey, like when you're yourself, it's really good. You just start feeling more comfortable to be yourself. And I do think in the poker community too, I was very nervous to approach people. I didn't know that much about poker. I was never going to be Christy and be able to talk strategy. I wasn't Lynn, like the sweet, nice girl. Um, so it took me a little bit, a little while to figure out and find my footing in the poker space itself. You're the girl that gets arrested for having brass knuckles in the airport, right? Exactly. Which by the way, that's like me. that's <laughs> that's quite a character arc, just a life arc that getting arrested and I I mean, knowing what I know about people, I would say that your relationship with Heath was probably greatly improved by going through that experience together. Whereas you just get on the plane, fly there for three days. I'm not saying that it wouldn't have been a great time, but you're not going to get to know each other. You're not going to bond as well as you did by going to jail. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's just funny how life works out at the end of the day. It's so true. It's so true. And even for me, I think the way that things worked out with my own parents and my own family and things, there was a lot of just like do it yourself and take care of yourself. And I remember when he, it, I thought I was paying for everything myself and I just was like dying one day. And I remember him saying like, I'll give you $5,000 to pay for at least like this part of your attorney. And for me, it was just like, holy shit. Like it was just so generous. And so, yeah, it really showed a commitment that I didn't, I think realize was there, which made it a lot easier for me to feel safe, I guess, which I just generally didn't for the most part. I mean, we, we need this in a partnership, right? We need somebody to take care of us, especially when we're dealing with something that's pretty unforeseen, such as your criminal record, um, your checkered past yes. that Heath now has to deal with. Um, <laughs> and uh, But then, then it leads you to poker, right? And you weren't very good, like you said. You have, over time, just began to get comfortable in your own skin and be yourself. And how? where does that go? Once you start being yourself, once you, you start you know, letting your guard down and just, just being you, let's talk about your career moving from there. So it was someone else was in charge of the video team when I came on board, Gloria Balding, who I actually still think was like really, really good and really underrated. But to be honest, like I always wanted to be the boss. I just thought there was a lot of mismanagement and poor decisions. And it's interesting because I would say like working on a lot of film sets, it's basically, it's basically having a ton of jobs. Like you just have the one job, you know, your main job, but you work on so many different sets and under so many different types of producers and different types of talent. And you just deal with so many different uh, situations in such a short amount of time that I think it really prepares you for for being prepared for a lot of situations and things to come up. And so when I first came in and I saw how the team was being run and managed, I just was thinking, wow, there are so many ways to avoid all these problems coming up and so many more effective ways to figure out who's going where and traveling. And so once Gloria was let go, they asked me to come in and sort of run the team. And that was, I think for me, that was 
even much better than getting better on camera was being able to make the team run in a way that I think was a lot smoother for the first like three or four years. And that's when Lynn and Christy and I got super, super close. And I think for me, I feel like that was sort of the heyday of poker news um, and just awesome content and people were everywhere. And then of course, I think it, it lasted for maybe a couple years after Black Friday, but Black Friday was definitely a big problem for for everyone and for the poker media, certainly. And so I think from a career standpoint, there's been, I've made a few more, you know, moves up the corporate ladder, if you will. But I always seem to come back to this, I don't know, more being in front of the camera and being more on the ground floor of the things that are that are going on. And I think it's because, I actually think this this industry is really, unusual in that I think there are a lot of industries where you can have people who come in from a corporate setting who can understand more or less any type of industry they can come into. You know, they can come in and consult on, you know, this type of oil business and this type of like paper business. Um, but I think poker is something really unique where it's really difficult to create content, make decisions, do really anything if you don't have an actual understanding of poker. And yes. so I think it's really hard. <laughs> it's really hard to find people to do well and find jobs that are successful in this business. Yeah. If I want to find somebody to edit videos, right? Like I'm making a YouTube video on poker tells, for instance, who the hell am I going to hire to edit this thing in a way that makes sense to me? Like they don't know where the poker tells are. They like, it's just, they're like, what's the river? And you're like, fuck. <laughs> now, now I have to basically get a dummy's guide to video editing and figure this shit out myself. And, and I realize like this is a big part of the barrier to entry when it comes to content. Is that the people that are qualified to help you don't know poker, which means that they can't help. So yes. basically what I'm saying is for people listening right now, if you want a gig in poker, just and you understand poker. Learn how to video edit, learn how to do these things because it's such a skill that very few people have. Yes, it's such a niche and it is so key. There's tons of things you can come in and make content about, I think, and not know that much about. You can edit, you know, all day long about like airline safety videos or anything, but poker is just something it's so niche and so specific. And it's just so hard to watch somebody do something that's, you know, generic or vanilla and really even making decisions on lots of things we had I'm not sure I probably shouldn't say that too much but we have been taken over quote unquote or merged with a lot of different companies in the last few years poker news has and um it's really a difficult transition to try to help people understand why things are running the way that they are when they don't understand poker everything from like decisions about travel to content, you know, creation, articles, social media, everything. If you don't understand poker, you don't, I get why it doesn't make sense why we do things the way we do. It yes. didn't make sense to me when I came in from the film industry. I was like, this doesn't make sense. But then now I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah, it totally does. It's different. And just dealing with the unique specimen that are poker players in general, this is a whole nother ball game. And I probably shouldn't say this, but I'm going to say it because eh, fuck it. <laughs> I, I did another podcast, right? And, and it was with Olympic champions and just pe high achievers in whatever field they were in. And I could book it out three months in advance. I, did, I don't have to follow up. I don't have to send an email. They show up on the dot. I've done 20 poker interviews. 14 of them have been late. Like just <laughs> time zone differences. One, one dude just said, hey, something came up two days ago and I need to schedule next week. This is after, of course, I waited on him for two hours to show up. For um, sure. <laughs> and in the beginning, like for the first few people, like I was like, no, I'm not like you're late, whatever. You, you don't respect my time. I'm, I'm moving on. And then I realized that if I do this, 
I'm not going to be able to talk to anyone. <laughs> it's so true. And people, when they first start, it's so funny because I've trained so many people now, you know, in production and, and whatnot in the poker world. And people, when they first start, I love it. Like they come in all eager beaver. Like, you know, I always ask people, like, send me your ideas. Like, what are some ideas you have? And they're always like, oh, like this idea, this idea, this idea. And it always involves doing something that's planned out with a poker player, talking to a poker player in advance. <laughs> Yeah. scheduling with a poker player in advance and I'm just like okay good luck we'll see how it goes and literally every the end of this summer then the new guy I hired Oliver Biles he was like okay yeah I totally get what you were saying now like not one idea that I had beforehand <laughs> was able to happen it's just that it's not but it's also crazy because they're such smart people it's really intimidating to deal with to put anything out there for poker players, really. Um, like I think, you know, I had worked with Ben Affleck and Jennifer Aniston and Will Smith and Charlie Theron. And and for me, I wasn't intimidated at all. I was just like, oh, you know, I'm like rubbing shoulders with these guys and it's not a big deal. Poker people are more intimidating to me, not all of them, but especially at first, a lot of them, because I think they're not as good with the social niceties, a lot of them for sure. But really? also just because, <laughs> 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 but they're so brilliant, right? That you think every mistake you make, every little, you know, error or tiny, you know, microcosmic something that goes wrong, they notice and they find it and they, you know, showcase it or figure it out. And so it's just this constant fear of just being a human being, like making, saying the wrong things, at making first, up a stat. I, at first I thought you were saying positive things about poker players. But as you went on, <laughs> it, it, it got less positive and less positive. But it's scary. They're scary. Poker players, like we read things, we read people for a living, right? And also our bullshit detector is fairly high. So especially if you're discussing strategy or something like that, it's like the first little thing and it's like, hey, change a channel, like... Or if you're more rude, just say something awful. Yes. For the plebes out here, like, I'm just like, oh my gosh, like, he's so smart. This is so brilliant. This is amazing. Like, and you just, and honestly, half the time I think, and this is what I always have said, people are like, oh, what are your best interviews? Always the best ones are the ones where I'm not talking at all and just holding the microphone. And they, and that is an important job also though, because sometimes if you hand the microphone to the poker player, things go really, really south. I will just hold the mic. <laughs> why, I know why? where the mic what, goes. What's the story of an interview going south with a poker player and a mic? Oh my gosh, they're crazy with it. It's like they don't, they understand so many things, but they don't understand that like the microphone needs to stay under your mouth if you're going to be <laughs> using it for, like I've had poker players really just grab it from me, which is, I'm not going to fight you for it. Like, if you really want it, go ahead. But then, you know, half halfway through their talking, it's just over on the side and you can't hear anything. <laughs> I've seen them hit themselves with it before. I mean, they are really like, I'll be the mic stand for their brilliant thoughts and just let them out. But there's, I have to say, there were so many people in the poker community that did finally, that did make me feel really comfortable, that showed me that they're not just these like robots or whatever, that they are also real people but there's also been plenty of moments where I felt and sometimes I wonder if it comes from my own self or if it's actually coming from the outside but I've definitely experienced a lot of condescending I think people in this industry much more so than in film and television which surprised me I would have thought it would have been the other way no I don't think you're right <laughs> <laughs> yeah no they're super known for their humility no condescension. I, I don't. I, mm -hmm. I can't remember a poker player being condescending. Never. And by, by in the industry, you do mean the players, right? Yeah. And even still, I don't know. It's interesting because I think it goes through these like periods that sometimes I can't tell if they're just nervous and uncomfortable or if they're genuinely like annoyed that I would bother them with this. But, and I also understand here's like one of the biggest struggles that I've run into. And I'm just so glad to go on maternity because I'm so sick of this thing. It's like, there's this really small group of high rollers, right? Like the same 50 guys maybe that travel to all the poker tournaments every time. And of course I've talked to them a million times. They've talked to me a million times. They're sick of it. They don't get paid for it. It's annoying. They just want to talk hands with their buddies on the break, which is something I can completely understand. 
but this is my job and the people want to hear them. So I have to keep trying. And it is, it does get awkward after a while to just be like rejected over and over by the same like 20 people uh, a million times for interviews, even though I completely understand why they don't do it. Obviously they're high six poker players. They're not actors and typically, or authors or whoever it is that promotes a thing and gets interviewed just over and over and over again when there are things launching. Mm -hmm. But still, you know, I, I touched on this with Berkey and Berkey said that Justin Bonomo, like he, he's a second winningest poker player of all time, but he literally knows nothing about Justin Bonomo that like he was a multi accounter and now he's the second winningest guy. And these stories are compelling. And the thing is like, when you tell these stories, you relate to people, it grows poker. It's beneficial for the overall game. Like you want to battle different people and not the same 20 people you see. Well, start being compelling, tell your story and get people interested in the game. Super hard, I think, to put yourself out there. Everybody that starts doing content at first, Matt Berkey included, I think it's always really difficult at first because people just, you know, judge you or people don't know what your motives are, what you're doing. But it's so funny because my aunt actually randomly connected me with someone the other day whose husband is thinking about becoming a, you know, turning pro or whatever in poker. And she's like, I just really want you to talk to her, see what you think. Sidebar, I think she's amazing. But she, she said, man, we just like love Matt Berkey. I'm just such a huge fan of Matt Berkey. And I realized like a couple of years ago, Matt decided to create content. I think it was really discouraging for him at first too, because you don't see this like right away, you know, the results of what, of all the effort and energy you're putting in are oftentimes not commensurate with people's responses. And yet after two, two and a half years, random strangers that I meet are like, oh, we're huge Berkey fans. And that is what is making people want to become poker players. And that is so good for the poker economy. So it's like in the, like what you're saying, okay, yeah, we're not launching books. We're not, they're not actors. I get it. But in the macro, making people love poker is what is kind of what all of our jobs should be, right? Of course, if you want it to be sustainable and go into the future. And also, like you said, your poker news, it's your job to talk to these guys. And when you talk to these guys, like it, it just helps everybody. So these 20 guys, get your shit together. <laughs> Please. And we can talk about whatever you want. It's fine. Like whatever you're into, we can do that instead. And yeah. Yeah. But I, I think that's at this point in my career, I think most, a lot of what I'm doing is easy. Lots of things I think I'm trying to do are new and different. Of course, I'm trying to explore more with social media and even with this like podcasting and video and doing more repurposing of content, but really like the, some of the hardest stuff is just wrangling players to circle all the way back to where we started. Wrangling yes. players is like really hard. You can talk to Elliot Rowe about that as well. We had quite the discussion after the podcast went off about wrangling these poker players. You've had some amazing people on though too, which is super impressive. I think sometimes I feel like I've just given up a little bit. Like after someone says no to me, like a couple of times I just give up. I'm like, I'm not coming for you anymore. You just got to hit or it from multiple angles. after they reschedule angles. too many times, I'm just like, I'm not, I'm not fucking stalking you, okay? Yeah, but. you just have to come at it from multiple angles. Like, you, you don't get somebody, you just talk to somebody else, and then inevitably they're friends with them. And if they have a good time talking to you, then they're more open to coming on. It makes sense. It makes sense. At least that's my theory. Also, just quantity. Just reach out to a thousand people and just play the numbers game and eventually people come what is up you future star of poker you coach brad here and i just wanted to take a moment to let you know about pkc poker if you're sitting there wondering to yourself why why is coach brad promoting this pkc poker app thing allow me a moment to explain my why battling in cash games has been my livelihood for the past 15 years it's how i survive and put food on the table for my family which makes it imperative that I either test out or seek qualified opinions on all of the poker platforms on the market. One juicy find can mean the difference between a meh year and an amazing family vacation in Hawaii kind of year. With that said, I have tried almost all of the major poker apps on the market to date, and despite the hype about amazingly juicy games, have come away from the experience unsatisfied. 
I was just never able to find success against seemingly weak competition and in one specific case was getting outright destroyed by passive villains playing more than 50% of their hands. What on earth was going on, right? After many evenings sitting in the bathtub wondering if I had lost it, I finally dug into the data and learned something that shouldn't have been too surprising to you. These dudes were colluding and super using their pants off. So I swore off those free money, decentralized devil apps and decided to go back to my more familiar streets of ignition. It was then that I was contacted by a good friend of mine who turned out to be the vice president of worldwide operations at PKC. Him and I had a long, in-depth conversation about security, the ecosystem, and the future direction of PKC, and he managed to convince me to give it a shot. That shot turned into an incredible six months with an hourly rate that's about five times what it would have been playing on any other US platform. As it turns out, I didn't forget how to play. I just needed to be on a level playing field to return to my crushing ways. I have no doubt that you, my community, my audience is going to play online poker somewhere. And I want to be damn sure that you don't go through the pain and frustration I felt by messing around with any poker app besides PKC. This is why promoting PKC is a no-brainer for me. I love you, I love my community, and I want to put you in the best position to succeed at this game that we both love so much. So if you'd like to join me in the streets of PKC, simply head to enhanceyouredge.com slash pkcpod and get your invite code to play. You must have an invite code to play and you must be 21 years of age or older. One more time, that's enhanceyouredge.com slash pkcpod to get your invite code. Best of luck, and now, on with the show. I, I do have other questions, actually. Did, 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 did I even ask a question? I'm, yeah, I'm very, I think it very was, relaxed. hey, how did you get into poker? And then I was like, here, let me give you a one-hour-long monologue about how I got into poker. It was a good story, though. Yeah, thanks. It was structured very well. Way better than those high stakes guys that won't tell any stories. <laughs> That's the worst part is like once you get these guys talking, they so hit themselves in the face with the mic. They no, just they're so interesting. So <laughs> Maybe many... that's the problem. Maybe they just don't know how to functionally hold a microphone. That's I mean, that might be the biggest problem. But I definitely do think it's it's and I think you have to agree. I think we even might have touched on this when you were on the Poker News podcast is that everybody has a story. Everybody. Everybody has some like crazy arcs and some, you know, stuff with their parents or their brothers or it's just like everybody is interesting when you like peel away the the layers a little bit. Of course. Uh, Of course. And especially when you're playing for millions and millions of dollars or buying into tournaments for... 100 or 150k there's obviously some compelling stories as to how that human being got there so let's hear them (laughs) yes um my wife loves your name by the way so where 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 did anti chardonnay come from well my husband's family are southern baptists so they had like they never never drink never have drank like which is just for me and the way that I was raised in my life, I was just like, what? So the first Thanksgiving that we were together, we'd only been dating for a few months and he invited me to come for Thanksgiving. And I was like, whoa, this is like getting serious really fast. Um, but I showed up for Thanksgiving with a septum piercing and a mohawk and all the things that I had at that time. I'm sure very, very sure that, that Heath's mom and Mimi were going to be open arms to me. Uh, I mean, he, he, Heath's had a mohawk too, right? Like right? he's a professional fighter. Sense. I mean. But to be fair, Heath's girlfriend before me was Lacey Jones. So I feel like she was like exactly what they were hoping for. Like a good Texas girl who was like, you Was know, she in poker too? Yeah, I think they met at like a celebrity poker thing. I might be wrong, actually. I'm not exactly sure how they met, but that's just what I imagine in my mind. <laughs> <laughs> I try not to imagine it too often, but sometimes like when I'm stalking her like online, that's what I think of. Um, oh. Not that I do that. I don't do that. We've been married for like ever. It's fine. Just sometimes like yesterday. <laughs> um, so 
I show up and my, my biggest concern was just, you know, how I looked thinking they're just going to have to deal with me. I'm just so like counterculture and whatever, but I brought a bottle of Chardonnay because like, obviously that's what you do when you come to someone's house for Thanksgiving. Right. And so I'm like nervous and I just get there and open the Chardonnay and like have a wine and just hanging around. They don't even notice that no one else is drinking. I didn't even notice, like I didn't even cross my mind that that's what was happening. Um, but apparently his nephews and nieces did notice that I was drinking because they had never even seen someone drinking before. <laughs> and so uh, he thought it would be a funny joke to tell them to start calling me Auntie Chardonnay which they did. And this was the first time anyone in the family had ever met me. So it just really stuck. And my name on like on Twitter and social media and stuff, I didn't have any social media when I came into poker and Chrissy and Lynn were like, you have to get on Twitter. You have to do social media or else you're never going to get interviews. So my name was Sarah Grant poker on social media. And then uh, I got married. And so I couldn't be Sarah Grant poker and Sarah Herring poker was too long. And so I just said, fuck it, dude. The world's about to meet Andy Chardonnay. Let's just let it out there. And I'm pretty sure- Is uh, Andy Chardonnay shorter than Sarah Grant Poker or Sarah Herring Poker? I think so. But actually I wanted it to be Auntie A-U-N-T-I-E, but that was too long too. So we had to go A-U-N-T-Y. And then I did a podcast with Christy and Lynn called Pretty Broad. And I would get drunk every episode and so they would always introduce me as Auntie Chardonnay. It was like my alter ego, basically my excuse to get drunk on the show. And it just really started spiraling. I do really like wine a lot, but I'm, I think I probably need to stop with that now that I'm making the baby. Is seven months pregnant? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've been, I actually, it's so funny. The last time I drank was the American Poker Awards. No, the Global Poker Awards. So it was April. It was a while ago, but I'm still thinking once the baby comes out that I'm like, oh, it's probably better if I just don't go back to that. I don't know. I'm debating. We'll see. I mean, a <laughs> lot, lot of, lot of drunk alcoholic parents out there that. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm sure they would encourage it. <laughs> I just, I do. I really just love wine, but it's a slippery slope. I've been reading all these books. I just read this book called Naked Mind and then I ordered one alcohol lied to me, but it's interesting. I think there's a lot of things that, that maybe I didn't think about how, how much programming I have about drinking, you know, Oh, this is like a situation where I should drink. And it's just, I'm a firm believer in trying to un undo the programming. And I feel like I didn't realize that alcohol maybe was such programming for me. It's marketing. I mean, yeah, there, there's a, it's a it's giant everywhere. machine. It's a, it's a multi-billion dollar industry. So of course there's going to be marketing behind it. Not just marketing though, but even people, like if you're not drinking, that people's response is how weird. Instead of like, you're literally taking a drug, right? The response should be, that's kind of crazy. But instead the response if you're not drinking is, why not? <laughs> yeah. Why are you not taking drugs? And it's, I think, I think it was interesting for me in this Naked Mind book to learn um, about what it's doing to your body and stuff, that it is a drug. It's a drug. Oh, of course it's a drug. Sugar's yeah. a drug. Yeah. But that's- I've been doing a lot more sugar since I quit drinking, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> you also hear these these like facts about wine too, is like glass of red wine's good for your heart, um, for the antioxidants, which is false grapes it's the grapes that are good for you the alcohol has no health benefit whatsoever you could just eat grapes and you're fine literally like there's a whole chapter on this in the book about all these fake health benefits which again they've got a lot of money right so it's in all kinds of stuff these ideas have been sprinkled all over there's so many things in in the world you know, like diamonds, for instance, just di diamonds are a marketing strategy that is probably the most successful marketing strategy of all time by the De Beers company. Yep. Have to be just careful. Keep them. They're the all just there. They're all just like in a little vault somewhere. So you can just like trickle them out. And yeah. They're, they're not even super rare. Like no. that's, that's the crazy thing about it. Like, and we just go about with our programming and thinking that ah, marketing doesn't really affect me that much. And we just do all of these things that we're programmed to do because they tell us to. It's crazy. And even when you think about, 
you know, we know now all the things about the casinos, for example, the scents they put in the air, the sounds they play, the way they, like, people don't want to be in the bright spaces, so they make the the cheapest games in the bright areas and, like, really put the, the put them away in the dark. Like, they've thought of everything. They're thinking of everything. And when they talk about, like, when you go into the grocery store, how things are designed, and really, we're just living in this giant sim and, try, like, just trying to unconnect from it, trying to disconnect from the programming is really hard it's almost it's impossible yeah. like when everything's optimized like you said the grocery store is optimized casinos are optimized our phones are optimized and the phone is probably the biggest killer and uh, attention sucker of all i have a journal and every day for the last week i've written create more than you consume like every mm-hmm. single day because I am weak. I'm a weak person. I fall into Twitter and I don't get out of Twitter and I find myself reading about stuff I don't even care about and just wasting so much time. So true. It's almost like incur- there was never a thing before where, cause I do this with Instagram, right? Where I didn't even know there was a search function on Instagram, like two years ago, the little magnifying glass or whatever. Oh my gosh. Now, when I think about the amount of time that I've spent just pushing the magnifying glass to see like stupid dog videos or whatever, <laughs> there never used to be like a, Oh, you have 10 minutes to just like nah, completely check out, like, go ahead here. It's right here. It's so easy. It's so funny. and so interesting. And yeah, it's a, it's a, and I, I'm not even a particularly big user of the social media. So when I imagine that this is what it's doing to me, I cannot even begin to imagine people who do it quite a lot. But also, I also have to say like what you said about creating, that is something I have to give people respect for because there was a time where I was just like, oh, these losers spend all their time like making social media posts, like get a life and you're lying. Everyone knows you're not that interesting or cool. (laughs) But I actually have to say as someone who doesn't, post that much or create that much that it's kind of like I'm just a a succubus then right like I get on there and just like use other people's stuff and and like oh that's interesting that's like you're an idiot you're not that cool (laughs) versus you know I have to give credit to the people who do you know put their time and energy and effort into actually putting things out there it's a full-time gig as much as I've tried to tried to hack it and make it faster and all these different things it's a full-time gig and if you take it serious, you're just going to invest a massive amount of energy. Um, what's the craziest thing you've seen in a poker tournament? I wasn't there for the um, robbery in Germany. That would have been a great story. I wasn't there. I don't know about the robbery. Um, so in, it was like an EPT in Germany, like maybe 2010, maybe something like that. But yeah, they had like uh, people came in with guns and masks and really just went for it you miss all the good stuff I know and I have to think you know there's been fights and stupid things but I think the great I remember at EPT Prague there was a four-way all-in with three eliminations when we were at a final table and that was like the best thing that ever happened to me at a poker tournament it was like 11 o'clock at night and there was still you know five or six people left and I was like oh gosh (laughs) there's gonna be another night where we're up all night And then we had a three-way all-in. And you know when you have the three-way all-in that for sure there's going to be like four double-ups and the person with the best hand is every single time like going to lose. Yeah. This time aces hold and three people are eliminated and the night lasted only like an hour after that. And it was great. It was a great thing. (laughs) I highly recommend that. (laughs) So if you could gift all these poker players one book to read that's going to improve their life, what book would you give them? Oh my gosh. I love reading. So this would have to be, okay. Can can I choose two? Because they're super different. Okay. 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 So Just Kids by Patti Smith, I think is like a fan, just a fantastic book in general, but also because it has a real focus in art basically and the appreciation of art as just art for art's sake. And I think for a lot of these um, real, you know, math logic based people that it might be good for them to think about just creating art also. Um, But in terms of a book that I think they would actually appreciate and probably that lots of them have read, Radical Honesty, I think it's, especially for really logic based people, it would be something that many people could get behind. Um, Brad Blanton, How to Transform Your Life by Telling the Truth. That's just something I think probably every human should read. Some of the concepts are a little bit I guess, not realistic, 
but I still think it's good to, you know, like telling your partner that you like have fantasies about other people. Some people might be into that. Some people might not be. I've chosen not to adapt that particular part <laughs> of the, um, the radical honesty philosophy, but for something that I read when I was young, it's like a lot of things that have kept, I've kept with me for a long time. Awesome. And by the way, since you have uh, a little, little child coming and, and art came up, I just want to tell a quick story that will be super embarrassing to my daughter in yes. many, many years. Um, my wife and I took the kids to the High Museum in Atlanta and there was an exhibit with a photographer and, you know, all these pictures on the wall. The kids are, of course, dying of boredom. Um, they're eight and 11 and we're walking through and they're looking at these pieces of art. And eventually I, I kind of see like coming up, there's this one with like the six-year-old daughter and she's nude, she's naked. And the girls are coming up to it and I'm like, you know, just kind of trying to like nudge them past, you know, like, all right, kids, let's, let's move on. Let's not just focus on this, this right now. And of course, this is like the one that has their attention. Like my youngest daughter is like, like I, she's moving forward, but looking backwards. And I'm like, uh, okay. So we, we move on and we find like the kid area at the high museum and they're like playing and they're creating a craft and like, there's this little connect thing on the wall. They're throwing paint and going nuts and it's time to go. And we're leaving, we're walking out. And my youngest one, Evie says, daddy, daddy, Nicole, can, can we, can we come back here the next time? And I'm like, yeah, sure. Like you had that much fun playing, playing with the paint and the, uh, all at the, all the kids stuff. And she said, no, I want to come back and look at the nudes. Stop. <laughs> Send mother effing nudes. It's like fully, fully immersed now. But isn't that crazy that it is such a, that it's a thing. Everybody wants to see it, right? <laughs> come on. Like, She's mom, get. eight. Yeah, it's interesting. It's crazy. And I wanted to ask you, actually, you mentioned about the phones and you mentioned about the kids and the programming. There are many ways that I am contemplating and trying to figure out how I can sweet baby Jesus like manipulate the world so that my kids are slightly less programmed um, or slightly to try to sh shield them from the programming as much as I can, maybe. But something that I'm really struggling with and like asking a lot of parents about is the screen time thing, this like phones and iPads and this, because we don't know any, I don't know anything about it and I never grew up with that. So I don't really have any litmus with which to judge it. What did you decide to do? It depends. I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't have any wisdom on this. Like they want to be right. They want to yes. learn things. They want to play games. I was 13 years old and I sat in front of a TV and played tons of video games myself. Like what are we talking like Sega Genesis? How old are you? This is 96. We're like Super Nintendo, maybe closing okay. in on Nintendo 64 days. Okay. Um, but I had a Game Boy too when I was eight or nine years old and I played the Game Boy. I spent a, I spent a lot of time in front of screens. Um, I think what's most important is, and I try to teach my kids this, always question why you believe the things that you believe. Mm. And we're in the Southeast and you mentioned Southern Baptist and I grew up Baptist living in Tennessee and, you know, you're in this bubble. I moved to Los Angeles and it's a little different, right? Living with the heathens. And what I realized was like my, the, my best friend in Los Angeles, such a generous, not a Christian, nice, awesome guy. There was one time, it was around New Year's and they were leaving. They were going on vacation to Africa. I was flying back home. Um, I said, I'm, I'm going to make a copy of your key and just put it under the door so that, you know, everything's good and then lock it. And, uh, his wife who, you know, obviously we're close, but like, it's his wife, right? Like I'm, I'm best friends with, with the husband. Um, she's like, Brad, you know, you're going to be coming back to San Jose before we get back. So just keep the key and fly back home and come back. And then you can just stay in our house, like until we get back. And I just remember thinking like, holy shit like I, i've never felt so welcome and, and and i think like these are the things that i've learned like okay non-christians are okay people too um and i'm not a uh well i've since changed my religious beliefs 
But that's not the point. The point is you're programmed to react in a certain way and treat people in a certain way. And like, it's all bullshit. So I tell my kids, like, I don't care what you believe. I don't care what you do, but whatever you do, make sure that it's you make sure that you believe this because you want to. And like, that's the advice that as a human being that I wish I would have had as a kid and not like, no, alcohol is bad all these things. Like basically I just become an adult and then I have to unlearn and figure out all the things that I believe that were basically just somebody else's belief. But what's so crazy is, and I think when you come from these two different, like I grew up super hippie, super like my, my dad was like, my family was super like against Christians, right? Because they're so judgmental, like which is so funny because you're just like judging them. Right? <laughs> you're right. But and 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 it's so funny now because like between my husband and I, we've like really we came from like two totally opposite ends of the spectrum. I've found ourselves like much much more seeing each other's sides and now like totally see the world like <sighs> explosion completely different than all the ways before. But it was so funny because I was in LA this weekend and I was arguing, not arguing, debating with some of my closest friends and women that I just like respect so much and love so much. And I see the world so differently than they do in so many ways, but it's interesting because so often it's two sides of the same coin instead of something completely different. Right. So like they are thinking, Oh, everybody who thinks like this must be just like a mean asshole, like jerk or whatever. Right. And then on the other side, like, you know, the Christians or like people that I go to church with, like, Oh, those people just must be like, you know, bad people and we should pray for them. And like, we can, hopefully they can become like on our side or whatever, but really it's two sides of the same thing, which is like, not, it's both being judgy. It's both thinking that you're, um, you're right. And everyone else must be wrong. And you know, what's the right thing to do. And everyone else must just be either stupid or immoral or whatever it is. And it's so funny because I'm just like, Oh, it's so funny. Cause you guys don't see that you're both the exact same, <laughs> exactly the same. Like, and, but, it, and just like you're saying, it can also be on the flip side, like so good that you can really see people exercising charity and compassion and, and generosity and, and all these things like with, with their actions. Right. Of course. On both sides, like doesn't yeah. matter who you are. Like, and this is like, it's just humanity, right? We're just human beings. And I do find it ironic that most people in like Adam for Adam in a different situation is exactly the person that they hate yes. because of that person's life experiences and now what they believe. I've yes. always found that to be pretty ironic. And so as an adult, like I said before, I, I've had a lot of growing to do over the last 10 years. I, I always try to remind myself of that. Like there, there are very few capital T truths in the world. They're mostly, eh, they're mostly just false. <laughs> There's not even really any lowercase tr- uh, T yes. truths. And there's like so much great. And that also there needs to be listening because even what you're saying, you know, I think also people are the most sensitive, not only to the person who's exactly them on the other side, like they're, you know, see their own finger pointing back. But I think people are also the most sensitive about the things that actually they maybe aren't as sure about, right? People get so defensive and so angry about certain things where it's like, whoa, 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 like come the breaks. We can just have a conversation and nothing that I say or believe has to be affecting you or making you upset or anything it can just be listening and I do think that's like with your kids and things in terms of finding what your truth is the only way that you can really find your truth is when you're listening for it right like you have to hear a lot of things to find out what's your what's the thing that resonates the most purely with you and I think it's really a struggle when you hear something that maybe doesn't resonate with what you believe but you also see that there might be some truth in that thing. And it's like, uh, how do I like make these things come together? And it's like, oh, it's hard to accept that sometimes maybe what you think it isn't black and white. But that's the thing. Everything should be up for analysis. Like yes. every belief should be up for analysis. And if yes. you're not willing to analyze it, if you're not willing to look at it, then maybe you ought to question that belief. Yes. Like, you know, there's nothing that's like beyond debate, right? Like even something, something like religion, like you should be able to intelligently debate your religion, right? Because if you can't intelligently debate it, then maybe there's something not right there. And I think that, that true, that truth does come with changes. Like, I, I mean, for me, so many things that I was so hard and firm on even two years ago, 
I don't see the same way now. And I think sometimes like there's this idea that, that if you always say and believe the same thing, that somehow that's like the right thing where really, I think if you're changing, it means you're listening and you're paying attention and you realize, Oh, five years ago, that did make sense. But now I realize maybe something else makes sense. And that should be encouraged. Changing your viewpoint should be encouraged, not discouraged. Right. That, that makes me think about um, like the John Kerry and George, George Bush election where he's the flip flopper. And you know, that's like a, this giant negative on John Kerry. And then when you really think about it, you're like, Oh, so learning and then changing an opinion is like bad. Right. Which is so crazy. Like if I think this, if I'm this, if I'm saying the same shit I'm saying now, 30 years from now, like what have I been doing? <laughs> like what's going on? And yeah. yeah. And, and another thing too, like about arguments, right? Like you and I, so, so we have an argument, we have a debate and most people treat arguments as like, you know, win, they, win, they go lose. with the war, win, win, win. Like I need to win this argument. It's war. I'm going to say whatever needs to be said to get this person to agree with me. Number one, they're probably not because you're going to get emotional and they're going to get emotional and everybody gets entrenched in their sides. But if you think about a lot, uh, an argument logically, then you and I are having a debate, right? And let's say I do convince you. Like who wins? Who wins in this argument? You win yeah. because you learn. I didn't learn anything. Like you changed your opinion. You grew, you learn. So like when you're trying so hard to win an argument, the other person actually is the winner. They, they leave with more knowledge. And so if you go into an argument with that mindset, like, oh, it's okay to lose because if I lose, I learn something and I grow as a human being, maybe, you'd, maybe you shouldn't be so emotional heading into these yes. arguments. Yes. And also even thinking of them as arguments is so hard sometimes where even I, my family, you know, completely sees the world this certain way. And then like my friends, this certain way. And sometimes when I'm thinking like, I'm actually interested in, in why you think these things or what you see, because you're my friend and I respect you and I appreciate you. And I want to know what's going on in your mind. It might not be what's going on in my mind, but that doesn't mean that it has to be that we have to be on the same program, right. To, to like appreciate each other and, and, value each other. And I think the more you value each other, the more it should just be that you want to know. Yeah, Why? of course. Tell me more. Like these things don't just happen overnight, just like randomly pop into somebody's head. There's reasonings behind yeah. all the beliefs. There's reasoning behind all of the action and just understanding the reasoning allows you to develop your empathy, allows you to, in my opinion, just be a more well-rounded human being that's more accepting and loving and kind and generous to fellow human beings, which I think should be the goal. Um, yes. And then you'll see that most, both sides of the arguments, quote unquote arguments, are almost always coming from a place of good. I believe this because I think it's like a good, righteous, you know, whatever thing. And I believe this because I think it's like the good, righteous thing. It's not like two people that are like, both assholes trying to be assholes it's like people right. trying to be good people and just coming at it from different you know viewpoints i mean I, I remember being at a poker table and a guy that i played with a regular who was always super nice always super nice to me he just said you know the south we just need to cut it off and throw it into the ocean and be done with all of those people forever and then go back to where i'm from and it's like the liberals in hollywood are ruining the world yes. they're the california is the worst place ever and you're like it's the same thing why are we doing this it's so crazy and and if you and if you believe like i think i hope you do or i do but for sure it's programming and it's intentional it's like divide and conquer. And like, as long as we're like down here fighting each other, we're not busy with like the bigger stuff. Of course. And, and like, yeah, it, it, it's programming. It is divide and conquer. Um, all right. Let's fast forward 15 years into the future. What are your accomplishments in the poker field going to be? I <laughs> think <laughs> my... I think probably the best case scenario that I have for accomplishments in the poker world will be, you know, making people laugh, being like real with people for a little bit. I am really not sure what the future in my career holds right now, mostly because I don't know what it's going to be like to be a mom 
So I don't know how that's going to shift or change things, what that's going to look like for me. But I think probably not dissimilar from what this is for you, mostly for me, the best things and the things I think are the most lasting are sharing real conversations with people and then putting them out there. There's always a market for that. There's a lot of people that can pretend to be nice. And there's only one Sarah Herring who's going to be genuine and authentic. And that shines through. I hope so. So where can the Chasing Poker Greatness audience find you on the interwebs? Oh, yeah. Anti, <laughs> A-U-N-T-Y, Chardonnay. Not I-E. Not <laughs> yeah. I-E. Don't be confused, which actually it is kind of confusing. And I get it now as I try to do things on social media. If it's not someone's name, it's so hard to just remember, like, oh, what are they at something? But it's at Anti Chardonnay on Instagram and Twitter. And you can find, supposedly I'm the face uh, of Poker News. So if you're looking to just like see a face, you can go to pokernews.com. You've been programmed into thinking that and now you're just saying it. So I'm the face. I'm like (laughs) mighty and powerful Oz and you can find my face all over pokernews.com. It's going to be the title of this episode. You you realize what you just did there, right? Fuck, dude, you've got to do got to do it at least once an episode. Sarah Herring, the face of Poker News. Yep. Oh, so good. Oh my gosh, I would <laughs> listen to that for sure. All right, thank you very much for thank being you, so Brad. generous with your time and coming on. I really, really enjoyed it. Ditto. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Chasing Poker Greatness. If you haven't yet subscribed to the show, please take a moment to do so on Apple Podcasts or wherever your favorite place to listen to podcasts may be. And once again, I wanted to let you know about PKC Poker. If you're on the lookout for a new poker platform where the games are safe and secure and the action's amazing, head to EnhanceYourEdge.com slash PKCPod to get your code and jump into the games. You must have a code to play as well as be 21 years of age or older. One final time, that's EnhanceYourEdge.com slash PKCPod. Thank you so much, and I'll see you next time on Chasing Poker Greatness.